Welcome back to The 99, where we're focused on brewing a better competitive commander. I'm your host, Patrick Marlette, and this is my overview of Time Spiral Remastered. That's right, the set that famously brought us things from other things in different colors. And this time around, with a bonus, we get old frames from this set. Well, a handful of old frame cards, uh, some old frame cards from this set of certain cards not even from this set, just one-offs for the set. So yeah, get excited for that <laughs> and get ready to see some much needed reprints in this overview. Yes, the set, is, there's no original cards here. However, there's some original art and some very much needed reprints of cards that us competitive commander players use. Now, this is all coming from the perspective of a competitive commander player, so if I miss a card, uh, you can't blame me. And although I'll be discussing the top 10 much needed reprints, in my opinion, that does not mean that if I missed a card, it's not worth it in your collection. As a matter of fact, there's a ton of great cards that are being reprinted from the set. In my opinion, these are the ones that need to be reprinted the most. And I'm very excited to talk over them in just a second. But gang, if you enjoy the content on this channel, that is the short segment that I've been running, the comical shorts, the weekly episodes, as well as the weekly live streams. The best way to help support this channel is via Patreon. Your pledge there goes miles into helping the production here. So thank you so much for pledging monthly. We have a lot of yearly subscribers. We're coming up on a year now. And you guys are the best. Thank you so much for jumping on the Patreon as soon as it was launched and hanging tight with me throughout all of this. I think March 18th is technically our anniversary, so thanks to all of you. Also, gang, if you want to help support the channel indirectly, the best way to do so is when you go out to buy these Time Spiral Remastered cards, and I'll point out all the expensive ones for you. If you use the link in the description to TCG Player, a small portion of those proceeds will go to help the channel. So thank you for using that link. More and more of you are. So me saying that has helped? I don't know, where is this coming from? You guys are so sweet. And as with every month, there's a monthly topic to discuss. And today's topic of the month is, what are your thoughts on the current reserve list buyouts and how have they affected your paper magic consumption? Now, I know for a lot of us, we are not playing paper magic these days, but has this caused you to refrain from purchasing any of those reserve list cards? Or are you selling off part of your collection because of these buyouts and price hikes? I'd love to hear your thoughts on this very topic. And of course, stay tuned to the end of this video where I'll share the thoughts of one of our brew crew members on this topic as well. Now, without further ado, let's jump in again in no particular order outside of how I've categorized these, the top 10 much needed reprints from this set. And I'm gonna start with some creatures, sorceries, instants, and then I'll go into lands. There are really no artifacts that needed to be reprinted from the set that were reprinted in this set. However, there are some pretty cool artifacts being reprinted in this set. But we're not mentioning any. I'll leave a link to the full breakdown maybe in the comments so you can check it out if you haven't yet. But this set releases later this month and one of the cards you should be looking at is Magus of the Moon. Now look, it doesn't make you a bad person to like stacks. It makes you a bad person to play stacks. So Magus of the Moon for two generic, one red, human wizard creature, two two body, non-basic lands are mountains. This sounds awfully familiar. There is a cycle of Magi, Maguses, and they all do things that other things did. Uh, this guy is essentially Blood Moon, and you can kind of see Blood Moon in the background there. And by the way, there's a handful of new art released for this set. This happens to be one of the cards with new art. It is fantastic. Um, I like both arts. I gotta say the first art kind of confused me as to what I was looking at. This is very evident, and it's extremely good. Now, why would you play this card? What list would you play this in? Well, obviously mono red. You know, unless your list is extremely proactive, like a Goto list, you'll probably avoid running Magus of the Moon. You'll probably avoid running uh, Blood Moon, but it's a great way to shut down your opponents. It's honestly one of the best stacks pieces you can run in the game. You know, it's, uh, it's similar to, well, it's really not similar to anything. There's a couple of things that shut down lands, like back to basics. Those are symmetrical as well, and they're pretty damning. But this is great at shutting down lands that your opponents control without hindering you too much. Now obviously, in a mono or dual colored list, this is probably going to affect some of your land base. And if you have some utility lands like you know, your Ancient Tombs, your City of Traders, this is going to reduce the mana you're receiving from those. However, excellent stacks regardless. I've seen tables just you go fall to their knees when you drop the Blood Moon, you drop the Magus of the Moon. The only fault with this card 
that I need to put out there is the fact that it is a creature. So it's prey to a lot of removal. And the more free spells we get, the more prey it is to common removal. Things like Deadly Rollick are going to hit this more often than not, right? If their lands are shut down, it's and it's very doubtful that you still don't see people running that many burn spells in Commander, at least at CDH tables. You know, not that many people running Lightning Bolts, not that many people running anything that's just going to outright damage this thing. So, you know, having mountains as a resource isn't really valuable for those lists. Also, do mind that when you shut down a certain portion of the table, you might be enabling someone else. So Magus of the Moon, if you know your player base has a lot of mono-colored lists in it, well, their non-basics are probably going to be minimal, right? You're not going to really hurt their land base too much. So it, definitely a lot to consider if you're playing Magus of the Moon and or Blood Moon. But for the most part, at a high-end table, when there's three to five different colored list, uh, you, this is going to be really good. It, it's always going to hit something. And it's usually going to be pretty damning, particularly if, you know, they're running fetch lands and dual lands and all that good stuff. Magus of the Moon. New art, you should check it out. Speaking of new art, Oh my gosh, I love this card. Same mana value. I, I got it right the first time. Simeon Spirit Guide. Two generic, one red. Creature, ape, spirit, two, two body. We all know what it does, but I'll read it off anyways. Exile Simeon Spirit Guide from your hand. Add one red. Well, this is really only going to be for, uh, for a few select lists. It's funny, I this this is the last creature in this category of creatures, and it's... Sad to say, you're really not using him for that wonderful ape spirit body. You're really just using it to accelerate your game plan. Now, if you're like me and you're on some sort of transmogrify builds, this isn't going to be great for you. But for everyone else, this is fantastic ramp. You know, it's great with the Adnaz package. It's great when you're trying to dump a handful of utilities and cards. You're trying to make plays on your turn. This is going to be one of those enablers. But early on, this is a great way to ramp into, you know, your Wheel of Fortune, any sort of uh, early game strategy you might be playing in a proactive list. Same thing with the other Spirit Guide, but I don't know if she got a reprint here, but we did see Simeon's Spirit Guide, and this is definitely one of those needed reprints. The last one that I remember pulling was from M25. However, the list, uh, apparently this was in the Mystery Booster. I don't recall seeing any, it could just be my luck, but this is a common from the set. And if you like the new art, it's time to get an art upgrade in the least. Uh, this is a fantastic card. It's always gonna be playable. It's probably gonna be cheap when this lands. You know, they, they usually run these spirit guides a couple dollars, but hopefully with these reprints, and that's sort of the secondary benefit of all of this, the prices of at least the current versions will be lesser than the previous ones. And you get an art upgrade. I kind of like the new art here. A little bit more as well but simian spirit guide fantastic for proactive list i wouldn't really advise it for anything that's too stacksy or too slow unless you're trying to pump out stacks utilities that have generic values and or you know, you've got that blood moon in the list this is going to help you pay that red and drop it with your ancient tomb on turn one right so it can be good there but generally speaking these are seen in more proactive list still good it's just you don't really want to remove a card from your hand for one red and a lot of other scenarios other than powering out big spells now moving on stories reason instances finally getting to an old frame border here and arguably this is probably my favorite copy of this card abrupt decay for those filthy golgori golgori golgari boys like myself golgori black and green mana value of two Instant speed. This spell can't be countered. Destroy target non-land permanent with converted mana cost three or less. This is one of the best pieces of removal. It still is. I know Assassin's Trophy exists. You should run both of these. As a matter of fact, because it's uncounterable, it does some things Assassin's Trophy doesn't without giving your opponents ramp. And most people have at least a handful of basics in their list. If you don't know what Assassin's Trophy is, I guess I'll throw it on the screen now giving editing Pat just a little bit more work to do. But Abrupt Decay, I think the last time this was printed was a guild kit, so it was definitely needing a reprint. And on top of that, it's coming in old frame. So if you didn't hear, there have been a lot of announcements for this set. A couple cards are getting printed in old frame bordering. 
and the old frame borders should come with a unique style of foiling, just the borders with a shooting star. It's a little bit of old MTG flair on a new card, and this will be the first time Abrupt Decay has obviously been printed in an old frame border, and it looks so good. Uh, I, I love the Seb McKinnon art for this one as well, don't get me wrong, but if I'm going to be destroying permanence of a converted mana cost of three or less, it's going to be with this likely. I noticed that they didn't change the wording to mana value yet. It's, it's, it's interesting that Strixhaven does have that text on the card, but they haven't gotten there yet with the Time Spiral set, so that's interesting to note with converted mana cost, with mana value three or less. At any rate, why is this good? At least in a CDH setting, this is gonna hit most every threat that's non-land. So unless you're going against like a Tabernacle of Pendril Veil, I, what, I'm trying to think of lands you would wanna hit. There's really not that many that you're you're really worried about hitting. And so, yes, sometimes hitting an opponent's land is really good for denying them a color. But I mean, if you're really worried about that, you can just run a strip mine, right? Like there's other ways to remove lands from your opponents. I'm not trying to look for like a kill all solution, you know, much like Assassin's Trophy. This is just gonna hit all of the threats that are damning to me, like an opposing underworld breach. That's really the big one that comes to mind, but any sort of stacksy creature that's on the field from the hall breach or the opposition agent, those are sort of the big ones still from Commander Legends and this hits both of them. So. It's great for that. It's not going to hit a majority of your higher CMC commanders, unfortunately. Like, it's not going to kill my Tevesh. But every other threat, game-winning permanent, this will destroy. And not be counterable. You're welcome. Thank you, Abrupt Decay. If you didn't know, it was reprinted. Dovin's Veto was reprinted as well. It's not on this list, because we're covering other counters on this list. But the next card we're going to talk about, at instant speed, is Angel's Grace. For one white, instant speed, split second, can we get a copy without the reminder text? Split second means that <laughs> as long as this spell is on the stack, players can't cast spells or activate abilities that aren't mana abilities. Okay. Every copy of this card's had that. Moving on. You can't lose the game and your opponents can't win the game. This turn, until end of turn, damage it would reduce your life total to less than one reduces it to one instead. So. If you don't know, there's an age-old combo with this card coupled with Ad Nauseam. So, Ad Nauseam, three generic, double black, uh, grab your library, a portion of your library. With Angel's Grace, so Ad Nauseam, holding priority Angel's Grace, you get to put your whole deck in your hand. You usually win at that point. You usually win at that point. I guess if there's a way your opponent, like Cephalid Coliseum, if there's some way your opponent can make you draw, um, even then, you can't lose the game, right? So they can get you off turn, but you're gonna win. You're gonna win. Usually if you add Nas Angel's Grace, you win. It's very hard to stop the person who does that. Yeah. Let me know. Let me know if you've ever stopped someone who's Angel's Graced after an ad Nas. I'd love to know how. At any rate, it's also good for stopping your opponents from winning. So the one-off kind of strategy with Angel's Grace is when your opponent goes to win with Thassa's Oracle, they resolve their demonic consultation, they say forest or whatever the hell they want, they pull through their list, you can do Angel's Grace so that they can't win the game. And that is also meaning cards that say win the game on them. So you can sort of stop them in their tracks. I don't like running it for that, but it is there for that. There aren't arguably that many great white utility cards in CDH, However, Angel's Grace is used for those scenarios, and it doesn't have to just be your Thassa's Oracle. You can stop a Lab Jace in the same sense. You can stop a Lab Man in the same sense. However, you are giving them the opportunity still to get that static effect off turn. It's really good for blowing out a Thassa's Oracle at best. And then coupled with Ad Nauseam, sort of the, nice, the nicest one-two punch with that card. However, it's definitely a needed reprint and Again, with new art from Zoltan Boros. This art is fantastic. I mean, I love my original art. I'm probably gonna hold on to mine, but if I get another copy of this, I'm not gonna be upset. Again, it's really best in tandem with Ad Nauseam. I don't like running one-off utilities like this to stop, even if it is the most common strategy in CDH right now, I don't like running it to stop one strategy. So in most of the list, I did incorporate it. I've taken it out. 
But if I was an Orzhov or any sort of color pairing with Ad Nauseam, it's a really easy add and you don't feel bad for running it because again, there's usually at least one or two Thassa's players at the table. It's crazy to say that, or at least with my group. And again, the prices on this card have been up there. They're like 10 plus dollars now, depending on the conditions. So hopefully this will bring the prices down. Mind you, this is the only card with this art, the only Angel's Grace with this art. So that might dictate some of its value. But I think for the most part, it should level out the prices on this. Usually reprints do. Now here's a card that definitely needed a reprint and it saw one in the mystery boosters recently, but not with this art. I didn't even realize how many great reprints we were getting uh, with new art, but this is another one. Uh, I'll never play it though. Delay. For one generic, one blue. This wonderful Omni counter. Instant speed. Counter target spell. If the spell is countered this way, exile it with three time counters on it instead of putting it into its owner's graveyard. If it doesn't have suspend, it gains suspend. Uh, it's got it's still got the reminder text. New art for delay. I know a lot of people love the original goofy looking art. I think this is fantastic though. It's probably the copy I would play with. But what's nice about this is that it is an omni counter. It counters any spell. Generally speaking, Counterspell and this, they're both very good, but this is fantastic in my mind because it's one generic and one blue, so it's much easier to resolve. And obviously coupled with any sort of cost reducers, it's that much easier to play as well. Uh, but this is great in multicolored lists that, you know, double blue can be demanding at times, so you can use resources that are providing blue and still have up a countermeasure provided you have anything producing generic and more. Right, so Delay is one of those Omni counters that you kind of pack in every list with blue. It's up there with the counter suite that is just always played, right? It sort of makes out that 30 percentage of cards in a blue list. Uh, Delay is one of them. So getting another copy of this card is fantastic. The prices have always been somewhat reasonable. I don't think they've ever gravitated much more than $6 for like a near mint copy, but obviously having more in the market is always a good thing. Having more with new art, is always a good thing. I, I, it, I didn't even realize until I was looking at it right now that this art was new. Uh, but yeah, if you needed a copy of Delay, now seems to be a good time to get one. Uh, again, just another fantastic card from this set, but not the only counter from this set that you should be picking up, because this next one, this has been going up in value. <sighs> Pact of Negation. So for zero mana value, instant speed, Counter target spell, another Omni counter. However, with the caveat, at the beginning of your next upkeep, pay three and double blue. If you don't, you lose the game. So it's got the same mana value as a Force of Will, but you do the thing uh, whenever you like, and you don't need to pitch a card or lose a life. You just counter target spell. So this is a card that's been increasing in value. Most free counters have held their value historically. I remember when I got, I, I bought a box at M25 and I got two of these. I got a foil one and I got a non-foil one, but they weren't, you know, 20 to $30 back then. And that's sort of what they're scaling at now. This card is fantastic to see a reprint of because it is one of those must own value counters that you should have and is used generally in every list that contains blue. You know, there may be some exceptions to that, but it's one of the better counters in the game. Because generally speaking, when you play this, you're trying not to risk the game. You can't obviously use this early on, right? So this is more of a mid-game counter spell, because if you do, you throw the game. And if you use this and you throw the game intentionally, I don't, I don't want to play with you. Yeah, I don't think I do. That's a little much. However, you can, and you can just throw the game, and I guess that's okay if your playgroup's cool with that. Have a little dialogue about that in the comment section. However, however, I, I could potentially forgive it pending the situation. This is one of those counter spells, though, that is going to be in every single counter suite. So getting another reprint here is excellent for us. Um, I don't, I don't use it. <laughs> I sold the ones I pulled from M25. If I pull any of these, I'm likely to sell these as well. No new art, but Jason Chan's work on this card is fantastic anyways. Now speaking of cards that really, really, really needed a reprint, this was printed once and it's not blue. <laughs> this is a card I use and it's a card I use in a current list that I am in love with. And that is Reiterate. For one generic double red, instant speed, 
with a buyback cost of three. So for a total of six, you can return this to your hand. Copy target instant or sorcery spell. You may choose new targets for the copy. Now there's a lot of copy spells that exist in red that only copy spells you control. Uh, this is one of the Omni copies. It's going to hit any instant or sorcery spell regardless of its controller. And that's excellent value for you because if you need to play this early on, you can steal someone's tutor. However, the real draw for Reiterate. Now I know that it's one generic more than your Fork or your Reverberate which are also very expensive these days. Not necessarily Reverberate, but Fork, because its reserve list has increased in value. It's like a $50 card average, I think. Obviously less pending condition, but Reiterate has also been creeping up there in value oddly. And then obviously with Time Spa Remastered, well, luckily we get another copy and a very much needed one because it's only had the one. And I think copies of that previous card go for maybe 12 or more dollars they were inching up there but this should hopefully stave off those costs the beauty of this card if you didn't watch my primer on rograk and devesh and or have played with me as i play this list um you can use this with anything that's going to net you seven or more mana that seems like a lot but in a lot of situations it's not difficult to accomplish i mean you can really just cast a jessica as well and have seven mana off of that I like to use it with Burnt Offering. I think you can use Mana Geyser. Is that the 5 CMC one? It's like 5 CMC, you add a red for each tap land your opponent's control. You can run this with Mana Geyser. So whether you're in mono red and or outside of mono red, there are lines of play that allow you to use Reiterate to make infinite mana. Because if I'm making a net positive amount of seven mana and this only costs six to cast, well, if I, and that's a lot of mana up front. But if I do, it's nine mana total. If I did Jessica's Will, and I copied it with Reiterate and bought it back, well, I make seven, cast it again. I'm net one mana. Oh, now I go up to eight, go up to nine. You get the idea. You make infinite mana doing this. And with Jessica's Will, obviously, there's more to that. If you have your commander out, you exile your library. Uh, there's a lot of cool combos with this. And again, it's not just relying on red ramp spells. There are other ramp spells you can utilize to get the ball rolling to make infinite mana. So if you've ever wanted to make infinite mana and then use this with any other card in your list to destroy the board, well, it's there for you. And we get a new copy. And I'm really happy they kept Dan Scott's work on this. By the way, I've written an article for TCG Player that I'll link soon, talking about my favorite reprints based on art <laughs> and value. Um, but that's going to be fun to discuss because there's a couple of really cool art reprints from the set that I'm very happy for. Namely, Kiki Jiki. Pete Venters, if you're watching, doubtful, your work is amazing. Uh, but that Kiki Jiki art from Kamigawa, the best. At any rate, yes, happy for Dan Scott's work here. Happy for Reiterate. You should pick up a copy if you don't own one. Copy spells, mind you, here's my prediction for the future. All copy spells and all redirect spells are going to go up in value. Because if you play non-blue list, they're the best effects. They're the best form of interaction. And you're starting to see that trend in, in price, you know, that sort of assessment in price uh, so far as some of these redirects are concerned, some of these copy spells are concerned. Aim's Mischief is one that comes to mind that's sort of up there in value now. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. It's totally worth the cost. Next up, I think this is our last instant spell, instant and or sorcery spell. I don't even think I covered a... I don't think I even covered a sorcery spell. Damn. Yeah, initially I, I think I had one here and I struck it for this one. <laughs> but this is, uh, I believe, one of our old frame reprints. And the last instant I'll talk about, it is Silence. Well, did you watch our most recent Brew Wars? Man, this card came in clutch in <laughs> a couple of situations. But Silence for one white, instant speed. Your opponents can't cast spells this turn. Ooh. Okay, so there's only so many cards in white that are considered staples. And I mean, they're usable outside of mono white. They're usable in two to three to four to five colored list. Any colored list, multi or otherwise, is gonna wanna use this card because it's, it's silence. <laughs> it's, there's nothing that offers you one, as much protection as this card does. Mind you, they can still activate abilities of creatures. That is relevant in some scenarios. But stopping them from casting any spell this turn 
lets you, you know, it just enables you. It just lets you go off with whatever your combo line is, and it's only costing you one mana value. It's only one white to do, but it's also extremely good for shutting off your opponents when you know they're going to try to attempt to win. You know, the upkeep silences of the world. We've seen them all the time, right? When someone does the top deck tutor, you see their board state, you know they're primed to go off, this person's tapped out, this person's tapped out, and the one thing that can stop them is a silence. Now, what's also good about silence is it generally baits those counters. Because in a scenario where you're, you know, going to threaten someone with a silence and they still want to push for the win, they're going to have to use one of their counter spells. It's going to be a blue counter spell, obviously. Unless it's a Tibble's Trickery nowadays, I guess. <laughs> it's usually like a Dispel or something, and they're going to have to use it on this to go off on their turn, right? And or keep you from going off on your turn. So this is just a good way to draw out counter spells, if anything, which is generally the bane of a lot of combo players uh, in CDH in particular. So Silence is one of those utilities that is good in any list, whether you're playing defensively or offensively. Oh, and the foiling's gonna look sick. <laughs> there's that, that little added bonus. It's just that and Abrupt Decay that get the old border treatment. But there's a handful of cool legendaries between Tassiger to Grenzo, and there's friggin' Yagmoth in there. There's a couple of really cool uh, commanders you can pick up in that old border foiling, or old frame foiling, as they're calling it. The last two cards I wanna mention happen to be lands. And the first one <laughs> is not in my favorite art, but definitely one worth picking up if you don't own, and it's Dryad Arbor. This card. So they're using the original Future Sight art for this, and it's a land creature, Force Dryad. Put it with your creatures. Put it with your creatures. 1-1 one, one body. So what is, what? It's a land creature. Dryad Arbor isn't a spell. It's affected by summoning sickness, and it has tap, add green. Oh, that's how it works. It's a, it's unique in that it's a land creature. Like, always, right? There's, there's other enchantments that make lands creatures there's creatures that make lands creatures there are lands that can consequently become creatures by pouring mana into them well this is just a creature land so what's unique about this one of my favorite things to do with dryad arbor if you've never done this uh this is why it's played in every green list in a cdh setting you can use green sun zenith paying one green and putting zero into x to drag out dryad arbor yes this works Yes, this works. Yes, it ramps you effectively like playing an Elvish Mystic on the same turn would have. But this way, you get your Dryad Arbor out of the way early. It doesn't have to be your slow land for the turn. And it's also offering you three mana on your subsequent turn, provided you have another land drop for said turn. It's fantastic. It's just really good value. Always. And again, it's just another creature to add towards that guy's cradle count, right? If you play a green list and you're playing competitively, you likely have a guy's cradle. This is just going to add to that count. Um, it's, again, amazing value. And the dollar amount for this card has been increasing, but this reprint should hopefully be under like that $10 mark, so it's immediately accessible. This is one of those cards you at least need one of. And there's a bunch of cards that I've been personally picking up singles. Uh, I've got a lot of multiples of certain cards. This is one of those cards. I have two from the vault versions of this. I just, I'm obsessed with that art. I also like how it's just a mana symbol in the text box. I wish this got that treatment. However, if you've been needing a copy, this is probably going to be the cheapest one. So this is the one to look out for. <sighs> Speaking of expensive cards, the last card. I, I wouldn't do this video without mentioning this one. It's had one printing prior from Time Spiral, if I'm not mistaken, and it is Gemstone Caverns. Legendary land. If Gemstone Caverns is in your opening hand and you're not the starting player, you may begin the game with Gemstone Caverns on the battlefield with a luck counter on it. Now, if you do that, you have to exile a card from your hand. So, <laughs> what's unique about the luck counter? If uh, you have it on there, you can tap it for one mana of any color. If you have that luck counter and it's a lot easier in a commander game, you going off play and you having three opponents means that this in all likelihood is going to be turned on for most games if you have it in your opening hand so it's it's predominantly i'll say that gemstone caverns is predominantly meant for proactive list not that many decks are going to want to exile a card from their hand and it could be anything like a land from your hand to a creature instant whatever to put this on the 
battlefield in the start of their game. It's definitely not for every list, and you can certainly use it in every list, but I don't think that's a good idea. Generally speaking, it's for those more proactive lists, like Simeon Spirit Guide was. But this card is... Whew, it's, it's expensive. It's it's at least 50 or more dollars on average, depending on where you're buying it. I mean, across from seller to seller, from site to site. This is one of those cards. It's the most expensive card on the list today, if I'm not mistaken. But it's going up in value because it's just a needed card uh, and a staple in our format. Uh, and if you don't have one, well, this is your opportunity. I'm sure Gemstone Caverns has played in other formats. Let me know which formats like using this because it can't just be Commander driving the price of this. I highly doubt that. The only thing that's changed with this is the bordering of it. Unfortunately, it's not old frame. It would have been very cool to get this old frame. However, the fact that we're getting it again is good enough for me. Wait, let's, let's I'm gonna stop here. When this set releases, wait at least two weeks, right? If you're not planning to play this, uh, if you're not picking up boxes, wait at least two weeks before you look at buying any singles because once the market is flooded with these, that's generally when the prices decline to their lowest point within one to two weeks. Sometimes it can happen immediately, but, and sometimes there are cards that are better to pre-order, not Chilled Lotus. But generally speaking, if you wait a little while, these will drop in value. So then use the link to TCG Player in the link in the description. However, those are the top 10 cards that needed reprints from this set very much all of these and there's a ton more from this set i don't know if i'm gonna buy a box to draft or play with it looks very fun to play with i think most of the allure for me is picking up some of those old frame arts there's tons of cards i want to get with that falling star on it however if the foil treatment is as bad as it was in commander legends i'm gonna be very very upset I don't know how these are holding up and I'm excited to hear how they hold up. If you're watching this after the set's released and you have some old frame foils, please share that info in the comment section down below. If they're curled, I'd love to know. Otherwise, this set looks to be a real value prop for anyone looking to buy a box and or a couple of packs. So hopefully you pull something good. But now as I do with all of these videos, I'd like to thank one random lucky Patreon member. And that Patreon member today is Joshin Redinger. Joshin, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, is one of our Brew Baby members and a long-standing one at that. Thank you so much for your support over on Patreon. You are among the best. And for his thoughts on the monthly topic, I'll be reading for Brew Crew member, Nettlesome Reflection. Ultimately, the difference between a real card and a proxy is becoming thinner by the day for me. Being collectible is really just a single aspect of the game as a whole, and I think should be divorced from the actual play of Magic the Gathering. The reserve list buyouts have only encouraged this attitude. I flipped most of my collection and bought into the reserve list pretty early on, and now my collection is just that, a collection. I play with my proxy decks, which I have at least one real copy of, sometimes strictly for vanity's sake, and all my real cards stay safe in a binder where they are protected. My entire playgroup is like this. My point being, I'm here to play the game, not prohibit it. Owning a real Mox Diamond versus a fake one shouldn't make a difference in a friendly game. Owning the card does not make you the player. It makes you an investor. And that will do it for this video. What are your favorite reprints from Time Spiral Remastered, as well as old frame additions to the set? And Ernest, my favorite reprint from the set has to be Street Wraith. The new art is so good. I don't find it to be too playable in CDH. Most blacklists trying to incorporate ad nauseum aren't gonna want a five CMC creature that cycles for two life, but the new art is so good. <laughs> I'd love to hear your thoughts on the set, of course, your thoughts on the monthly topic, and everything else we've discussed on this episode today. Again, my name is Patrick Marlette, and happy brewing, babies.